and we're back in the lighthouse. We're about to enter the future of money constellation. We're really excited to have with us again, Lord Adair Turner, who brings an incredible amount of perspective to a wide ranging amount of questions. And what he does better than most is to provoke our thinking. And I might reflect on the numerous occasions that he was the keynote speaker of many of the INA conferences. And in particular, one question comes to mind that sticks to me to this day, which I'm sure he'll touch upon in his talk, is indeed the question, have we solved the economic problem? That is, have we reached a point that Keynes has anticipated? And indeed, amongst these questions, I'm sure we have many more in the future of Money Constellation. I would like to remind us again why we're here. We are here to explore new economic questions. And throughout this plenary, we would like to converge on the 100 most pertinent questions that we would like to answer as the, the YSI community. Now, in order to do so, we're, we're going to ask you to submit your own questions, which Lord Adair Turner will reflect upon at the end of his input talk. Now, exactly how you can submit your questions in the constellation, here's a video. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question, and each group of stars, or constellation, contains questions within a particular topic. You can find questions fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, Think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI, not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. It looks like we're ready. Let me do a final check to see whether we can beam up to the future of money constellation. Question moderator Zasha, check. Session moderator Stefano, check. Lord Adair Turner, check. It's a go. Let's go up to the constellation. What's the future of money? We wonder, but our vision of the future is muddy. It's funny, some investors trade in futures for money, but some investments made may trade our very futures for money. What is money? It's a means of intermediate exchange, a unit of account, a store of value, and it's strange. You can't regulate and designate the value it obtains, but you can't control the chemicals it loses in our brains. Croesus was the richest in the midst of the Greeks. They say the first to mint a coinage as his riches increase. They used to have to mine it, now it's typed on the keys. An ever-changing flow of mighty, mighty revenue streams. What will money become? Well, now that's hard to define. But I guess it's kind of fitting, it can be hard to find. Currently, our currency is churning online, where the fate of many myriads can turn on a dime. And it's fine. But what's its future, if any? Will money be diminished like the copper and pennies? Is its essence so indelible and endless? necessity or does it possess but phantom truth whose vanishing sets us free i won't say which one is it i'll just touch it and go like it's a phone payment system what is money's role and what a role most efficient and where's the money going if it goes where you miss it what's the future of money
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another question fair session. Uh, this one will be on future of money and it will be following the talk by Adair Turner. Uh, as you have heard from Jay and Heske, uh, we are going to listen to Adair's talk and while we do, we are trying going to try to think of potential questions that relate to his talk. Not the questions to ask him, but research questions that are relevant and related to his talk. These questions you can submit by using suggest question uh, button, suggest uh, uh, question button on uh, the right hand side of the of your screen. What you can also do is you can like questions. Uh, you can uh, add a heart in the right far, far side of that bar uh, and uh, the questions that get most likes by the end of the talk will be then brought up to uh, Adair to comment and, uh, and tell us his opinion. We will then return back here and continue uh, with rephrasing uh, and, and working on this question for some more. And without further ado, uh, please let's start with the session. Okay, hi everyone, I am Stefano. I'm a visiting researcher at UCL and I'm a candidate in political economy in Amsterdam. Um, we're very excited to have you today, Lord Turner and uh, really looking forward to his presentation. Lord Turner chairs the Energy Transition Commission and he has um, held very high profile roles in public policy. Very importantly for the, our discussion uh, today, but also for his presentation in the past, of course, the UK's Financial Services Authority. Lord Turner has been uh, a keen um, uh, proponent and he has stimulated our understanding of money um, but also on how our economy is changing. So we're very excited to have him here today. Please, the floor is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I was very interested in that uh, introduction about the future of money or the nature of money, uh, which is something that in the past I've thought a lot about. Uh, indeed, some of you may know my uh, book on between debt and the devil, money, credit and fixing global finance where I thought quite a lot about what is money. And I think it's a crucial question for uh, economic uh, inquiry. Uh, but I'm actually not gonna talk about that uh, today. I'm gonna talk about some aspects of our economic thinking, which we can think of in entirely real terms. Uh, my own approach to economics is that you have to think about uh, real relationships, relationships uh, which you can at least uh, think through even without adding uh, the, the numeraire or the unit of account uh, or the role of uh, money uh, as a constructed uh, social uh, creation. And then you have to add in the monetary side to have a complete understanding. But my focus today is going to be entirely on the, as it were, real side of the economy without thinking about the monetary uh, conditions. And I was asked to provide three questions which to talk about why to me they're interesting and hope that they might provoke you uh, to think them interesting as well. And those three questions are one, what's the future of work if machines can produce most goods and services and what follows for jobs and inequality? Number two, this is the order in which I'm gonna do it, what are the long-term consequences of the transition to a world of abundant, cheap, zero carbon energy? And three, how can still poor countries achieve economic prosperity when the export-led model no longer works? And that third one is going to follow, I hope, from two propositions that I will have established in talking about questions one and question two. This, these three questions are ones which I'm thinking about because of two things that I'm doing at the moment. One, as Stefano said, I chair something called the Energy Transitions Commission which is a global commission working out how we get to a zero carbon economy by changing the energy system. But at the same time, I'm also writing a book in called Capitalism in the Age of Robots, which will come out published by Princeton Press uh, in early 2021, 
which builds on a lecture uh, I gave of exactly that same title, Capitalism in the Age of Robots, which you can find uh, on the INET website, which I gave in 2017. So let me start. What's the future of work if machines can produce most goods and services? As most of you will know, all of you will know, there is a proposition out there that the wave of technologies, which are information and communications technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, are taking us into a world in which, with increasing speed, we can automate almost any work activity. And one of the standard texts of that might be uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee's uh, The Second Machine Age. It was an issue explored, I think, very well about four years ago by the McKinsey Global Institute, who did one of those analyses that broke down at quite a granular level. What is work? You know, how much work is repetitive physical activities? How much work is repetitive cognitive activities? How much of it involves, needs to involve an emotional reaction with others? How much of it is actually physical and tactile? How much of it is entirely abstract? And on the basis of that, they inferred, both with existing technological capabilities uh, and with technological capabilities which are probably bound to develop in the future, that even today, we could do with about without 50% of all work hours uh, in the world, and that by 2050, that could be 80 or 90%. That basically, the issue of automation was when, not if, that we were going to wipe out uh, the role of the need for work. Uh, and as Jay mentioned earlier, of course, that relates to uh, a famous article which you'll find in uh, a paper which you'll find in John Maynard Keynes uh, Essays in Persuasion his 1930 article paper on economic possibilities for our grandchildren in which Keynes said then we have solved the problem no not we have then he said we will within two or three generations have solved the problem of production we won't need to work any longer we'll be able to work for only 15 hours a week and have a perfectly nice lifestyle. So this is posing a question which has been posed before. And of course, the moment you realize that it's been posed before, a lot of economists, their default position is to say, well, that just proves that the hypothesis is fundamentally wrong, right? That you have an economy in which however much we automate one sector of the economy, we will create jobs in other sectors of the economy. And that bluntly is the default um, uh, uh, reaction of us clever economists. We know that out there, there are some lay people who don't really understand uh, our deep religious secret, which is uh, economics, and they suffer from this lump of labor fallacy, where once something gets automated, there's mass unemployment. But we're the clever people. Uh, we understand uh, that that's not true. And that bluntly does tend to be our default assumption. But I think we are at a stage where we have to challenge it in two ways, one of which is about particular conjunctures and the other is more fundamental. The conjunctural challenge is about the nature of different waves of technology. The way that as we develop new technological capabilities, although in the long run we will create new jobs, the long run might be quite a long, long run, and the new jobs that created might be at a very different wage level than the jobs in the past. And one of the really thoughtful books on that, I think, is Carl Benedict Frey's uh, The Technology Trap, and also the work of Darren Akamoglu. They have pointed out, for instance, that if you go back to the early 19th century and the initial technological wave of the Industrial Revolution, which made us able to produce, for instance, textiles in a semi-automated fashion, that for about 30 years, the impact of that for the condition of the working class in England, as Friedrich Engels put it, was pretty catastrophic. Uh, that all the benefits of that went to the capitalists and almost none of the benefits to the workers. It was different in the late 19th century. 
And Akamar Glue and Frey have explored the different nature of different forms of technology, what they do to the substitution of capital and labor or the complementarity of capital and labor, which can produce different effects at different periods of time. So I think there's an interesting body of thought as to whether the particular wave of technology that we have at the moment is more likely to be like the first half of the 19th century than like the second half of the 19th century, and in particular, more likely to be uh, like that than like the mid-20th century, uh, which people like Robert Gordon, who's on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, bookshelf behind me, has called the golden age of American prosperity, when a set of specific technologies to do with the internal combustion engine uh, and other, the application of a, a electric machinery into the home produced a golden age of sort of middle class and working class prosperity. It is possible that this is a particular form of technology which uh, is impoverishing for many people, even if in the long run, there's a lump of labor fallacy and will create more jobs. The, so I think that's an interesting area to explore. I think Akamoglu's stuff is interesting. I think Benedict Frey's stuff is interesting. I think it's just an extremely important area for us to look at. However, I think we also have to have our mind open to a more radical challenge to the lump of labor fallacy, which in David Susskind's book, A World Without Work, he labels the lump of labor fallacy fallacy. Uh, he argues that in arguing uh, clever dicks like us of the economists that we understand the lump of labor fallacy, we are in ourselves subject to a fallacy uh, that in the long run, we really will create an era in which we don't need to work at all. And I haven't got the time to go through that, but I think that is an interesting challenge. You know, has it simply been a particular conjuncture over the last 200 years of the pace of technological change and our desire to consume ever more, which produced an environment in which technological change didn't produce either mass unemployment or an increase in leisure? And is it possible that those conditions no longer apply in future? And that, as it were, Keynes was right he just got the generations a couple wrong. When he said it'll be in two generations, the problem of production uh, will be solved, he should have said three or four. I actually have a considerable degree of sympathy for that point of view, and I'm going to set that out uh, in my book. But I think that whole area creates an interesting set of, of issues. Now, one other question which people might pose when one says, look, we've got this amazing, as a uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee suggest, we've got amazing pace of technological advance, you know, Moore's law, computers getting cheaper, uh, mobile phones getting cheaper. Okay, why don't we see it in the productivity statistics, the solo paradox? And I just throw out one thought of why I think we don't see it. I think that there are a lot of benefits from this technology which inherently will never throw up, emerge in the productivity statistics. The fact that I am now able to earn exactly what I was doing to before without spending an hour commuting because of the technology we are now using is an increase in correctly measured productivity which is not going to show up in normal GDP measures. Commuting, commuting is unpaid work. So don't be fooled by standard uh, measures of productivity. There's lots and lots of ways in which these new technologies that we're using, whether it be search engines or uh, uh, Zoom calls or whatever, uh, do not show up in the statistics. But in addition, I have a hypothesis which I set out uh, in my uh, lecture, and which will be a key bit of my book, that one of the things we are doing in the modern world is what I call proliferating zero-sum activities, that essentially more and more of human work activity is essentially a form of zero-sum competition. More and more people employed as lawyers essentially to argue over the size of the economic cake not to increase it. And again, if for some reason uh, that uh, shows up, well, if it shows up uh, as an intermediate product, which it does if it's a corporate lawyer, but not if it's a divorce lawyer, uh, then you will have a pace of automation, 
allowing us to employ more and more people in these zero-sum activities, but you'll never see it in productivity measures. And indeed, it shouldn't be because it's not a form of productivity. Put it all together, and I'm actually convinced that we are going through something which is not just another change in technology, uh, but quite fundamental, that it is taking us into a world in which we could go down the Keynesian direction of the economic possibilities for our grandchildren and be in a world in which we would have all the products and services which we truly enjoy uh, while working only 15 hours a week. And I think the likelihood that we will do that is almost nil. I think what we will do over the next 50 years is find things to do, a lot of which are zero-sum uh, competition. And I think as we find things to do, this will also be a deeply unequal world. Uh, one of the paradoxes I set out in my book is that it is zero-sum activities which are the least likely to be competed away, automated away by technology, and the most likely to pay people a large amount of money. So I've got a set of hypotheses there. I hope I've said enough to at least stimulate you to maybe uh, look at the lecture, uh, look at the book, which will take a lot of the thinking a great deal further. But I simply suggest that in this area of automation, work, inequality, what precisely is work? Is it truly contributing to human welfare, or is it zero sum? How do we measure productivity? Is Solo's paradox simply the fact that we measure it in ever more useless fashions? I think this is a very, very rich area to explore, and one that I would encourage you to explore. Now, my second uh, question is the long-term consequences of a transition to a world of abundant, cheap, zero carbon energy. And you may say, well, where is this world of abundant, cheap, zero carbon energy? Well, I was the first chair of the UK's Climate Change Committee back in 2028. And at that stage, we set out, it's the committee charged by the UK government for making sure that we become a zero carbon economy by 2050. Uh, at that stage, the target was actually 80%. It was subsequently upped to 100%, partly because of the technological breakthroughs that have occurred. Back in 2008, we tried to work out what was going to happen to the cost of wind and solar and batteries. And I hope that people have destroyed the reports that we then produced because they were just so embarrassingly wrong. We thought we'd have sort of radical scenarios in which the cost of solar might come down by 40% in a decade. It's come down by 85% in a decade. Wind is down 60%. Batteries are down 85%. And if you look at a reasonable technological point of view, and my commission, the Energy Transition Commission, has set this out in a recent report we've produced called Making Mission Possible, we are going to head to a world in which we will have abundant zero carbon energy. It's certainly going to be abundant. Just remember this simple fact. The sun, which is a giant nuclear fusion plant, fortuitously and safely placed 93 million miles away. It produces unbelievable amounts of energy, but even the amount which produces just Earth is 8,000 times as much energy as we use in all our homes, our offices, our industrial, our transport systems, etc. We only have to capture an 80th of 1% of that. We only have to cover about 1.5% of the land area of the world and about 0.3% of the surface area of the world in solar panels. And we could consume completely zero carbon electricity, five times as much electricity as the world consumes at the moment. And it will be cheap. It's come down in cost 85%, and it will probably come down another 75% by 2050. We are going to have cheap zero carbon power. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing for the world uh, economy. And with it, we will be able, through making hydrogen and ammonia, to decarbonize even the hard to abate sectors of the economy, like steel production, plastics production, aviation, and shipping. But there's an interesting feature of this very cheap 
energy. Apart, I mean, at one level, it's just you've got a cheap factor of production. You can think through all the beneficial effects that that would have. It has one very interesting feature for a market economist, which is that this zero carbon electricity is low cost, but at the marginal cost, it's basically zero cost. This is essentially a system where we make some capital investment, and once we've made it, it works itself, right? These are solar panels or wind farms or batteries. Think about them as things where 95% of the annualized cost that you work out follows from your annualization of the capital cost. Only 5% will come from actual year-by-year -year annual operating costs. And that has some really interesting features uh, for how does an economy work like that? How do you make a market work when there is so little zero marginal cost? Are the natural providers um, uh, monopoly providers? I mean, we know that zero marginal cost tends to produce monopolies. Does that mean that we should run it in a somewhat state-planned fashion rather than a, a market fashion? This will absolutely transform the uh, economy uh, of the world. It will transform it along with knowledge. Knowledge and knowledge embedded in computer hardware and software is also another bit of our economy where we have initial investments and then zero marginal cost. So what is going to happen in energy is quite similar to what's happened in the arena of mobile phones and hardware and software. Think about software. The key feature of that is once you've created one copy of it, you can replicate it a billion times at almost zero marginal cost. That's why Mark Zuckerberg is so rich, because actually the cost of producing the machine, which is Facebook, is a trivial cost of production. And after that, if you can get a network externality effect, you get a, an enormous benefit. So both in the information and communications technology side and in the energy side, this has major implications for market structure. But it may also have major implications for areas of our economy we wouldn't necessarily anticipate. I think one of the most interesting areas forthcoming is what is called precision biology. Think about how we produce meat protein at the moment. It's one of the most stunningly inefficient processes anybody could design. Photosynthesis in fields is a very inefficient process for turning solar energy into usable energy. And then we put it through an unbelievably inefficient factory processing plant called the cow, uh, which both uh, has these enormous uh, inputs of vegetable matter in order to produce a certain amount of protein, and as a byproduct, uh, produces methane. In precision biology, you can take knowledge and electrical energy, and you can produce synthetic meat. And there's a wonderful new report by a company called Rethink X, which simply points out this simple piece of economics. Compare the cow with synthetic meat. The cow is not getting more efficient. The synthetic meat has two inputs, knowledge which is relentlessly increasing and energy which is relentlessly decreasing in cost. Put the two together and it's simply a matter of time before this new technology system beats the old technology system called the cow. And I want to link this finally to my third question. How can still poor countries achieve economic prosperity when the export-led model no longer works? The classic model of growth from low income to high income, and the only model which we really know from the last half century of economic growth is one which goes through a period of export-led growth, basically driven by labor cost arbitrage. That's what East Asia did, Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, and then on a huge scale, China. And across the world, there are middle income, lower middle income and poorer countries, for instance, in Africa, which hope that they can follow that path. They hope that as China late wage rates go up, some of that activity will move to them. They will be able to absorb labor, get to a certain standard of living, create a self-generating process within themselves. 
I think we live in a world where that model is catastrophically threatened. And it is threatened by both of the trends that I have talked about. I think we are going to see the almost complete automation of manufacturing. I think we will see manufacturing coming back to the rich developed world with almost no workers in it at all. Uh, for instance, Adidas have just recently opened a factory in Bavaria. You cannot imagine a place in the world with a higher labor cost per hour than Bavaria. This is the most expensive labor in the world. But they are going to produce shoes there because it is totally automated. So the manufacturing route to export growth, I think, is eroding rapidly. It holds out in one or two sectors, such as textiles, uh, and in particular, apparel manufacturing, because so far, we haven't quite been clever enough to replicate the fine motor skills of human fingers. But it's just a matter of time before robots can do that. And if you then add that to my point about knowledge and energy and precision biology, I think we're going to also go into a world in which even agricultural exports are threatened by our ability to produce synthetic carbohydrates, synthetic meat, uh, synthetic to do urban farming in controlled environments. I think there are some things that make me really optimistic about the future of the world. Cheap, zero carbon power is one of them. But there's one question to which I don't know the answer. I don't know what the development model is for a poor country in a world where the export-led model is disappearing. Logically, there has to be one, because there was a development model for the world, and the world is a closed economy. The world didn't go from its prosperity of 1800 to its prosperity today by having a set of exports to other planets. It managed to achieve, on average, a path to prosperity, even though it was a closed economy. So you can't say that the only path to export growth, to, to, to prosperity growth, is exports. There must be some indigenous, a uh, uh, non-export-led model that gets you there. But I don't think at the moment we know what that is. And I think one of the most important questions uh, of economics is to try and work out what that might be. So I hope those three questions have at least stimulated some thinking. Thanks. I can't hear you. <laughs> Usual mistake. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I think we've, we've heard uh, some really interesting and uh, kind of broad discussion in the sense that we've both heard some really positive messages about how our technology could really help us solve some of the biggest challenges uh, worldwide. Um, but then, of course, you ended up your talk with... Uh, some problems in terms of distribution of those benefits and how um, uh, growth may not happen so evenly um, given these technological advancements. Uh, so thanks, it was a really interesting uh, discussion. Now we have uh, rounded up a couple of other questions. We actually refer to uh, some of the fallacies or traps that you've described before when you referenced to, to uh, John Mayer Keynes. Um, so it's interesting that our um, members have selected those. And I think it's, it will be a good chance for you to elaborate a little bit more on whether these questions uh, can be useful and how, how so. So the first question is the following. Um, have we solved the economic problem which Keynes anticipated? That is, could we all in principle live a life of leisure? And again, it goes back to your initial questions. You'll have to mute yourself as well. <laughs> uh, look, I think the question, the answer is essentially yes. Um, my own belief is that we have seen in the rich developed world, without us quite realizing it, a relentless growth of what I have called these, these zero-sum activities. And clearly, you're going to have to read the book to see my, uh, my analysis of that. I've had a very good researcher from LSE pouring through 
um, what people do, and we've been coding it for which we think are partially zero sum or not. And we think there's been a significant growth of those uh, over the last 30 years. Um, I think um, it, even today, if we just said, look, we're going to give up on a lot of, you know, really quite unnecessary work activities and just try to enjoy as best possible the things that are really enjoyable in life, all the goods and services that we actually enjoy, which, you know, which don't include getting on a commuting train, you know, don't include arguing in court, uh, don't include, um, you know, um, cyber criminals attacking on one side and cyber experts having to a, uh, defend on the others. If you could do that, you'll never be able to do it. Uh, I think we could enjoy our standard of living with far less work than uh, we are doing today. And I think that will become even more so over time. And I think that will extend to other people uh, in you know, a, a wider and wider set of countries. I think essentially, although it's sometimes sort of... Um, you know, it's sort of fashionable on economists to take Keynes's economic possibilities uh, for our children and say, aha, that's one thing Keynes got wrong, didn't he? I actually fundamentally think Keynes got that right. Um, but for a variety of reasons, we, um, we, as one of the sub chapters of my book is called, we find other things to do. Now, this poses some interesting questions, which is, do we just accept that human beings are like that, right? Because actually, they quite like working. They, they like finding purpose. They can find that purpose sometimes from truly creative economic activities that deliver goods and services which increase human welfare. But they can also find purpose from entirely zero-sum uh, activities. And one point I make in the book is actually some of the most idealistic people in the world are involved in activities which you might think of as completely zero sum. I mean, if you join an environmental charity to argue against the lobbyists on the other side, you are engaged in an activity which quite clearly in its net total uh, effect is zero sum because you're almost cancelling each other out, but you're idealistic. So there's no lineup of what is satisfying or what is idealistic or what is good versus what is zero sum or not. So maybe we'll keep doing it. And I don't think we can stop that. But I think I would say two things. One, we have to look very carefully at the distributional consequences of this, because I think there is something about these modern technologies which are tending to create uh, an increasing inequality of distribution. And secondly, I think it would be pretty stupid if we didn't take at least some of the benefit of our productivity increase in increased leisure. I don't think we need to take it all in increased leisure, and I think there's something about human nature that means we won't. But if we don't take any of it in increased leisure, uh, I think we are probably... Uh, making some pretty stupid collective decisions. And by the way, of course, what you have here is all sorts of possibilities of bad equilibria. So people's ability to choose more leisure options is constrained by the work contracts that they're offered. It's constrained by the need to compete with other people for zero-sum goods, such as property, in locationally desirable uh, locations. You know, a lot of what we do when we pursue more income in life is not pursue it in order to have more products or services. It's because there are a small number of things which are positional goods and where all that matters is my income relative to you because that's going to determine which of us gets to buy the nicer located house. And the more that we allow those sort of competitions to be extreme, the more that we will find a large amount of human activity devoted to something which is, you know, collectively not beneficial in terms of our aggregate human welfare. Okay, thank you. Um, now, this may be a little bit of a, of a detour because your talk has so far been so far being quite uh, on, on the long run dimension of, yeah. uh, of our economies. And as some uh, 
RBC macroeconomists used to say that money is neutral in the long run. Um, well, we may not for the moment just believe what they said and just focus on the short run. And let's go to the monetary side because it could still be possible for money to play a role precisely yeah. in catalyzing these changes. So the second the question that we have uh, is as follows. How does our shared understanding of the origins of money inform the way policy decisions are made? That's a pretty tough question. Well, I hope it's going to be enough to... Um, wow. Right. Yeah. Well, that is a tough question. Look, my, my point of view, which I express in Between Death and the Devil, uh, is that, well, money is clearly a social construct. It has value because we believe it has value or because a, a, a state, a political authority says it has value. You are allowed to pay your taxes in it. And when I pay my army, you have to accept money in return. I mean, so the whole thing in all aspects is a social contract struct, in part a state contract construct, but also a construct which can emerge autonomous from the state through the bank creation of money. And I am among those who believe that uh, as a uh, as Willem Boyter uh, put it, and, and, and I quoted him uh, at the top of uh, my final chapter uh, of my book, um, he, 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 he had a phrase where uh, basically he wrote a wonderful uh, article in 2009 called On the Unfortunate Uselessness of Most State-of-the-Art Academic Monetary uh, Economics. Because most state-of-the-art monetary economics, at least until I was looking at it in detail about five years ago, assumes that there's this thing called M, money, um, assumes that it came from somewhere, but does not understand that most of it came from the banking system, assumes that the creation of money is the motive force, whereas I think that the creation of credit is the motive force and money uh, the consequence of, of that, and then assumes a set of things to do with the demand for money as a function of income and interest, which I, I think are largely you know, mythical uh, bits of assumption set. So what do I believe? I believe that Clearly, um, you can enter environments where I think you have to start by saying, can we in macroeconomics enter environments where there is inadequate nominal demand? Yes, we can. That, that can occur. In those environments, what do you do? Um, well, you must never say that there's a limit to what you can do because you can always create money. Uh, because, because money is a social construct, there's, there's no limit to how much we can create. The one thing where policymakers have entirely failed is if there is ever a depression produced by inadequate creation of nominal demand, because nominal demand is the one thing we can create. But policymakers can't create productivity growth. They can't create more real resources, but they can always create nominal demand. So the answer is, I do think we need a shared understanding of the fundamental nature of money, the fundamental potential to create money, credit and money, state or bank on limitless amounts. And that all the most interesting things in money on the macroeconomic side are the political economy of how we create enough of it and don't create too much of it. They're how you um, create demand, but don't overcreate it. And broadly speaking, I think what mainstream neoclassical economics and central bank orthodoxy did was arrive at a solution to that political economy challenge by setting up a, a myth, right? And the myth was um, the moment you monetize debt, you will create hyperinflation. Or 
you can't do it in any case, or in some absolute sense, you shouldn't do it. Uh, you know, they have been so terrified of engaging with the issue of how much nominal demand should we create by what mechanisms, terrified that it is impossible to construct a political economy discipline around that, that they have retreated into a sort of Wizard of Oz, um, you know, closed circle in which they tell the uh, external politicians that something is poss impossible when it's clearly possible. Now, I'm sorry that was a bit of a ramble, but you did, you know, ask me to answer a question that I could have spent my whole, my whole half hour on because uh, I chose to answer a question on the real side of the economy rather than monetary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, it was a, it was a pretty, pretty tough question, as you said. Let's, uh, let's hope that the short run that you've just dealt with, that the nominal short run will collect with the real long run that you mentioned from before. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Um, right. So this is, sums up the first part of uh, our session. Um, but we can go back to the studio and then uh, to our second part. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you all out of there. Great. Thanks. Thank you. We're back in the lighthouse. I think we had a great session. Thank you, Lord Turner. It's been a pleasure having you. For those of you who are, are still currently in the future of money constellation, you are going to continue to refine the questions that have now been raised by Lord Adair Turner and yourselves. So use the next minutes. Um, in that session to finalize, the, finalize those questions. Those of you who are with us on the live stream, stand by, the program is rolling. We are coming back in about 10 to 15 minutes at the top of the hour with Bill Janeway. <laughs>